So, hello everyone and welcome to this next session. We're really delighted that you are joining us here. A um, bit of housekeeping just before we begin, partly because no session uh, starts effectively without a bit of housekeeping and it gives people just joining us a moment to uh, get to their seats. So as most of you will know by now, we're using the Slido app to capture your questions. So please either download it if you haven't so far or use the functionality in the conference app. We will be having a series of presentations uh, to start with in this session and then an open discussion uh, with the panel and we'll be drawing on your questions there. So do please feed them in. Um, you're also more than welcome to tweet during this session and please use hashtag BX2019 to do so. So this session... Beyond Unconscious Bias. I've got a confession. I'm Hilary Spencer. I'm the director of the Government Equalities Office. I'm very committed to inclusion and diversity, and I'm biased. Some of those biases I know about, and some of them I don't. Even worse, you are biased too. You, people who have come to a behavioural insights conference, are also biased. And as we all know, everyone else is too. And that bias affects all of us. It affects all of our working environments, how inclusive they are, how effective they are, and even how profitable they are. So in the Government Equalities Office, our work focuses on improving equality. Things like closing the gender pay gap, improving policies for LGBT people, and reducing sexual harassment. But one of the challenges in this area is that while there is a lot of activity of people trying to make things more equal, more diverse, more inclusive, which is great, the evidence base for that is still quite weak. And so a key focus for us is trying to build and improve that evidence base so that we can help people take the right actions to drive equality. Some of you will know, in 2016, uh, Iris Bonnet published a really important book called What Works? Gender Equality by Design. It's made a huge contribution to shaping the debate about how we use behavioural insights to boost gender equality in the workplace. And for those of you who have not had uh, the pleasure yet of reading it, or those who perhaps read it when it first came out, a brief reminder that she makes the following arguments. Unconscious bias distorts the outcomes of core workplace processes, such as hiring, promotions, performance management and salary setting. And this bias and this distortion holds women and other groups back. We need to redesign our workplace processes to reduce or ideally eliminate bias. And many of you will be familiar with examples of this, things like name-blind CVs. Redesigning workplace processes is far more effective than trying to change people's minds. Uh, and there is increasing evidence that unconscious bias training doesn't really change behaviour. So all of this is sort of her hypothesis. And I think a key takeaway from her work is that we should be trying to focus a lot of our effort on debiasing the systems as much as we can. So partly inspired by her work and with our focus on trying to close the gender pay gap, we set up a partnership between the Government Equalities Office and the Behavioural Insights team at the Gender and Behavioural Insights Programme, known affectionately as GABI. Um, we're focused on trying to build the evidence base about what really works and bring real rigour to what organisations and human resources departments are doing to improve equality. So Hannah Bird will set out a bit more of our work here later on in this session um, with some fresh insights and some exciting trial results from the programme so far. But the title of this session is all about going beyond unconscious bias, making conscious changes that can boost diversity and inclusion. And I'm really delighted to have with me on this stage, on this panel, some expert speakers to help us try and address some of these challenges, to move the discussion on to the next level and help us really shift the dial on equality and diversity. So each speaker will speak for 10 minutes and then we'll have an open discussion drawing on their inputs and your questions uh, through Slido. And I'll start then by introducing our first speaker. So Dr Anitha Ratan. Uh, 
Anita is an Associate Professor of Organisational Behaviour at the London Business School. Her research focuses on mindsets and intergroup relations like stereotyping, prejudice and inequity. There's a whole fascinating world of things that you're working on and I'm not going to try and praise any of that. I will instead therefore hand over to Anita as our first contributor. So much. So to start this afternoon, uh, I'd just like to ask you a simple and straightforward question. If you are the peacock in this image, how do you feel? <laughs> so some people might look at this image and think they feel special, they feel unique. Other people might look at an image like this and feel uncomfortable already. Um, and the reason that I start with this question is to give all of you a kind of visceral and really basic understanding of the psychological construct that I study in some of my research, which is our psychological sense of belonging. So if you looked at this picture and you thought, if I were the peacock, I would feel great, well, that tells you you automatically felt a sense of, that you belonged, and therefore you could feel special for your unique attributes. But if you looked at this picture and you thought, ooh, did I mean to show up at this penguin party or am I in the wrong place? Well, then that tells you that you had more of a question of belonging in your mind. So I start this way to give you that visceral understanding of sense of belonging, but also to highlight for you that absolutely everyone out there in the world has a fundamental need to belong. What that means is that when I study psychological sense of belonging and I talk about uh, interventions to try and promote belonging among women and different types of minorities, I'm not talking about anyone's special feelings. There are no special feelings here. These are feelings that everyone has. And what I try to do as a researcher and a scholar is I try to understand how we can structure environments so that everyone has an equal ability to feel like they belong based on their social identities. So it could be that this penguin on the end actually doesn't feel like it belongs at all because it's not doing well in this workplace. Uh, maybe it just doesn't fit the culture, a whole host of different reasons. So you can be a member of the group that is well represented and not feel belonging. And that is super important and super interesting, but not what I focus on. What I focus on is this reality that when we encounter contexts and uh, organizational situations or teams where the people around us do not share our identities, it raises a question of whether or not we belong in our minds, and we look to the environment or to the context to tell us about whether this is a place where people are going to treat me in a way that makes me feel like I belong. So. Um, just to put some concrete language to this, a lot of people talk about representation. That focuses on who is where, and so it gives us a demographic summary. It's useful in certain ways, but I argue that for organizations, for academic contexts, um, it's just not enough. A lot of people talk about inclusion, and I think we need to view a term like inclusion with some criticism and some uh, kind of skepticism, because inclusion is about the context letting people in. But we know, psychologically, that it's not just about the context letting people in or welcoming people. People have to actually experience the context that way. And therefore, that's why I focus on this idea of belonging. Um, I have so much to say about belonging. I could keep you here all day talking about it. Um, and so what I've done is I've given you my simplest non-technical definition of belonging here, which is we agree I can be myself here and be an equal in the context. Um, and there are lots of ways in which re that re in, excuse me, there are lots of ways that research has identified um, to increase belonging among stigmatized groups. And again, it's that specific type of belonging that has to do with the concern about not being included because of one's social identity. Um, what I want to highlight about this array of different uh, ways of boosting belonging is that some of them are really hard and are going to take a really long time to actually improve in a, in a way that works across many organizations and industries. So yes, increasing representation is important, 
but increasing representation to parity across all of the different diverse groups we might care about is actually a big challenge and is going to take time. Reducing stereotyping cues really matters, but in some industries, it's very hard to reduce stereotyping cues, and we know that representation itself is a cue to stereotyping, so there's a really difficult to break cycle here. Um, where my research takes off from is this idea that a certain type of positive interactions uh, between people of different identities benefits belonging. In particular, interactions where members of negatively stereotyped or stigmatized groups feel a sense of respect for their competence, those are interactions that can affirm the belonging of individuals who are in contexts where they're still underrepresented and aware of it. So in my research, what I try to do is I try to understand whether we can construct environmental signals that communicate a sense of respect for competence to members of stigmatized groups. And the way I do that is by intervening on the mindsets in the context. Mindsets are an idea that were first studied and popularized by my graduate advisor, Carol Dweck. She studied mindsets about whether people's abilities are fixed or can grow, and that's some of what I study as well. Today, though, I want to talk to you about people's mindsets about whether potential in a field is widespread or limited to just a select few. So if you think about the incoming cohorts of uh, new individuals coming into your organization, or if you're an academic and you think about the incoming cohorts of students, do you think they all have potential to achieve highly in the domain they've been hired for, or do you think it's just a select few? What I argue in my research is that there's a cognitive overlap between these mindsets about the nature of potential, which actually in and of themselves don't have anything to do with group memberships, they don't mention group memberships, and social stereotypes that label members of certain groups as less able than members of, of other groups. So for example, women and racial minorities. Um, and so what we wanted to test in our research was whether we could adapt the mindsets that are communicated in the context in a way that would intervene on women and minorities' experience of uh, the context as being potentially stereotyping, and therefore on their belonging. So in a first study that I'll share with you, we had uh, European-American and African-American undergraduates at a state university in the United States. This was an experiment and a lab experiment. So students read about a course that they were potentially interested in taking but not sure about. They read that the professor was introducing the course and that the professor said, I know this course has a reputation for being hard, and it will be. This is not an easy class. And then they read that the professor either said, I know that each and every one of you has the potential to perform at the highest level in this course, and then we just repeated that idea of potential is widespread one other time. So the potential is there in every one of you. Or they read, I know that only some of you have the potential to perform at the highest level in this course. The potential is there in some of you. So psychologically, we would argue that this is a relatively light touch uh, manipulation. Um, we manipulated this uh, mindset about potential is widespread versus this mindset about potential is limited to just a select few. And then we simply asked these students, how much would you be interested in taking this course? What we found is that when the professor said, this potential is there in some of you, we replicated the uh, attraction gap to the STEM course that is typically out there between races. So African Americans were less likely to want to join this course. But when the professor said, this potential is widespread, there was no gap between African Americans and European Americans in their interest in the course. Um, in a second study, we wanted to look at this among uh, men and women, again in the context of STEM, where women are underrepresented. And we measured, uh, we manipulated the mindsets in the same way. We measured uh, these men and women's sense of belonging, their social identity threat, which is their concern about being uh, viewed through the lens of stereotypes, and their perceptions of the faculty as actually, truly, in their heart of hearts, believing these gender stereotypes that are out there. This is the manipulation. You can see we adapted it slightly. We just added a couple of extra words to reiterate the same point again. What we found was that when it came to belonging, we were able to close the anticipated belonging gap between men and women when the professor communicated this perspective that potential is widespread. This was um, also the case for 
men and women's concern about being viewed through the lens of stereotypes by the people in their environment. And we not only closed the gap, but we actually brought women down to the level of men in terms of having lower concern about being viewed through the lens of stereotypes in the environment. Um, and when it came to their perceptions of this faculty member and their actual true beliefs in their heart, when the professor communicated the non-universal belief, you see what you generally see, which is that women anticipated the faculty member would believe stereotypes somewhat and men less. Um, in the universal condition where the professor communicated this view of potential as widespread, we reduced that and equalized it between men and women. So to conclude, uh, what I hope you take away from this talk is this idea of psychological sense of belonging and the importance of understanding it amongst the people in your organization. Um, I hope you can see that signaling a belief in potential as widespread can speak to women and minority sense of belonging because it can speak to uh, the kind of cognitive overlap between beliefs about potential and stereotypes. So it can kind of turn down the volume of their concern about being stereotyped and therefore boost their ability to feel like they can belong there. Uh, my next goal as a researcher is to do a field experiment in an organization. Uh, and so I will end by saying, if anyone finds this interesting or compelling, please open your doors. Let's work together. Uh, because really, to take this stuff out of the lab and into the real world, that's the next test we need to do. Thank you. Thank you. So lots of good food for thought in there. Thank you so much. So our next speaker is Dr. Elizabeth Linos. Um, Elizabeth is an Associate Professor of Public Policy at uh, Berkeley, and her research focuses on how to improve government by focusing on its people. Yeah. I'll just leave that pause uh, there <laughs> where we are. Um, but you, you will talk to us uh, about a whole set of things related to that, including uh, burnout and a range of other topics. And obviously, as a, a sort of former member of the Behavioural Insights team, we are delighted to have you here. Thank you. Uh, well, hi, everyone. I am also delighted to be here, not least of which because I'm learning already from my fellow panel members. Um, so uh, I'm Elizabeth Linos. I do work on how to improve government services by focusing on the people uh, that deliver those services. And what that means in practice is I work on how to recruit, retain, uh, and motivate civil servants, the government workforce. Today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, an issue that I think all of us have at least heard of, many of us have experienced, and that's burnout. Um, so burnout is really characterized by, by three things. Uh, it's uh, firstly a feeling of chronic emotional exhaustion at work, the feeling that you really just can't take it anymore. Second, it's a feeling of reduced personal accomplishment, the feeling that you just can't do the things you want to do at work. And for those that are delivering services on the front line or directly, there's also a sense of cynicism or depersonalization from the people that they are trying to serve. Now, if you felt this at work, uh, know that you're not alone. Uh, about one in five employees right now um, are currently experiencing burnout in some of the studies that we've seen. Um, and there's a sense that this is kind of on the rise. We don't know if it's just reported burnout on, is on the rise or real burnout is on the rise, but um, you'll hear people talking about a public health crisis, an epidemic of burnout in the workplace. Uh, the WHO just changed how they um, talk about burnout to talk about it as a syndrome. Uh, and that's really important in thinking about uh, how we take this seriously at work. But if you focus on the front line, uh, I'm talking about the teachers that we uh, ask to take care of our children every day at work, or police officers that we depend on to make really critical decisions in a responsible way with uh, not a lot of time, or social workers who have to make decisions about whether or not to remove a child from their home, those kind of really crucial parts of service delivery, the rates of burnout are through the roof. So in some of our studies, they're 50%, 60% of staff are burnt out. And so it's no surprise that at this point, about 40% of staff in these frontline worker positions are quitting in the first two years of service. That's really what I'm going to focus on here. Um, I've started to think about burnout as a diversity and inclusion issue. So just to give you a sense of the lay of the land in some of our early studies, 
many of you will not be surprised to hear that women report much higher levels of burnout than men. Um, this is even more true for working mothers. We can talk about this in Q&A if you want. Um, but some things are um, less obvious. So for example, even though burnout is a chronic phenomenon, a chronic form of fatigue, um, at this point, it looks like younger people are reporting, reporting much higher levels of burnout. And that's really interesting when we think about who quits early in their career. When we look at people of color versus white people, we don't see a very obvious trend. So going back to something that Anitha said, you know, representation is one way of thinking about this issue. What is perhaps more interesting is thinking about it as an inclusion issue. So here the evidence is, I think, pretty consistent. When you look at large surveys of employees, those who feel that they are socially supported at work, that they have friends at work, that they feel like they belong at work, report lower levels of burnout. And this seems to be significantly true in very different professions. Um, what we think about when we think about burnout is, OK, some people seem to have friends. Some people feel like they belong. But as a policymaker or as a practitioner, how do, you, how do you build that? How do you create an environment in which people feel like they belong? And can you do that in a way that can meaningfully change these very chronic, serious symptoms of burnout? So for today, um, I want to tell you about a study that we've done in collaboration with the Behavioral Insights team. Uh, it focuses on 911 dispatchers. So in the US, these are the people you call uh, when you call the police. Um, and they are incredibly important in law enforcement. Uh, many of you will have seen critiques of what happens in, uh, in the US when people call the cops on black people. One of the arguments that is coming out now is rather than focusing on racist call makers, we should think about the call takers and how we can adjust the decision making of the person who's picking up the phone. That's the 911 dispatcher. But 911 dispatchers are an interesting case in law enforcement. They answer about 240 million calls in a year. They have ridiculous hours of overtime. They're not paid very well. And for various reasons, they're not even considered first responders. They're considered call center workers. And that's meaningful because it means that when a mass atrocity happens or if they're facing a lot of trauma in their work, they don't get any of the mental health services or support or even social status that other first responders get. And so we find in our research that about one in two are experiencing burnout right now, and the rates of uh, sick leave and attrition are very high as well. So what we did with the Behavioral Insights team in North America is we worked with nine cities, nine US cities, and we said, okay, what can we do, given that we can't change the stress of the job, to change the environment in which people work to see if we can increase not only the sense of social belonging, but a sense that this is a professional group that should be valued, that should be taken seriously, and that has something to offer. So really drawing on similar uh, research to, to what Anitha was talking about, um, we wanted to find a way to um, get people talking about each other in a way that kind of promotes uh, the sense of community. In practice, what we did is um, we set up a field experiment, uh, and we sent our treatment group uh, weekly emails over six weeks. And the emails were structured to say things like, um, what would you tell a newbie about what it's like to be a dispatcher? What advice would you give? Or another um, weekly email would say, like, what would you say about um, being a mentor on the job? Or what are the characteristics of other people um, that you respect? And all of these messages had the same um, underlying theme. And that was, you know, rather than focusing on how important you are to the community or the people you're serving, we wanted people to reflect on how important they are to each other. We know from other research that uh, when you give advice, the advice giver is actually benefiting a lot more than the advice taker. And so we wanted to build this sense um, that this is a professional community that can help each other and that they actually do understand what others are going through. And then we followed up uh, with administrative data and with survey data for the next four months. And we don't have a lot of time, so I'll, I'll go straight to the results. Four months later, we see a significant reduction in burnout. On the validated scale, this is about eight points. That probably doesn't mean anything to a lot of you. It's about 0.4 of a standard deviation. In practice, it's about the difference between a social worker and an administrative assistant in terms of burnout. So this is a significant and persistent reduction in burnout. What's more stark is that we also see a significant drop in resignations post-intervention. 
So in the four-month follow-up period after the intervention ended, it looks like we halved the resignation rate, a little bit more than halved. So this is the first of many studies. And if you've learned anything at BX, I hope you've learned that we shouldn't take any one study seriously. Um, but it is promising. We are learning something about tools that might be available for something as difficult uh, and complicated as burnout. Uh, right now, I'm running a bunch of other studies with other frontline workers. We can talk about prison guards, if you want, or social workers. And I'm also extending this research to think about decision making. So if we do manage to reduce burnout, yes, we can keep you on the job. But are you also going to be making different decisions because you are less burned out? So that's what we're studying now. But I want to leave you with this last thought. Burnout has always been discussed as kind of a chronic medical phenomenon. And it's really important that we don't forget that you know, a lot of the reasons why people are burnt out at work are systemic. Low pay doesn't help. High stress environments don't help. Uh, having mandatory overtime, like a lot of my populations um, have, doesn't help. So there are a lot of high demands that are really important. But when we think about burnout, I want us to also think about these uh, other parts of what it feels like to be at work, whether or not you belong, whether you feel like you have support, whether you feel like when adversity strikes, someone is going to have your back. And so when we think about burnout, I want us to also think about inclusion. Thank you. Thank you. And as you say, sort of fascinating to already start seeing the links between the work that you're doing and I hope um, gives us some good input for our uh, discussion as we move through. So our third speaker is uh, Frank Douglas. So he is the uh, CEO of a consultancy that he founded in 2013, born in the US and raised in New York City. Frank came to the UK in 1998, uh, working for British Telecom as head of HR strategy, where he was the first HR manager to win the BT Chairman's Award. He's been included in the list of the top 30 most influential HR directors in the UK, elected non-executive director of the City and Guilds Group and non-executive director of the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development. So we are really looking forward to hearing what you've got to say, Frank. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So the first thing is I'm going to challenge your uh, mindset because I don't have any slides. So your visual diversity as well as some cognitive diversity is going to be part of the day. Um, I'm a practitioner. Um, the honorary doctorate doesn't play in my family. My wife has a real PhD, so I don't even talk about that. Um, my firm is focused on inclusion, and we start with it from the perspective of the lived experience of the employee. We basically try to find out what happens when you walk in the door at nine and when you leave at six, if you wish. And what are the real contextual issues in each organization? My basic point of view for the next 10 minutes or so, and by the way, I was in awe when I was invited to speak here, and I'm saying behavioral psychologist, the insight group. And then when Roni told me I had 10 minutes, I realized they don't really know much. Because if you want me to speak for 10 minutes, you tell me I have three minutes. Um, so <laughs> the, the nudge theory did not work there at all. Um, but. Um, We've spoken to probably face-to-face, because -face, it's what we do. We we've probably have met with over 1,000 employees in the UK and, and, and the US in all sorts of companies, industries leaders in pharmaceutical, global financial services, legal profession, technology, advertising, broadcasting, entertainment. And basically, our viewpoint is most of your DNI initiatives will fail. Most of your behavioral interventions will fail because there are structural barriers that have not been changed or challenged over the years that will impact and disable your efforts. And I'm going to start with just a couple. And my, my view is from the battlefield. I wish I could have some fatigues and have a little stripe there, just look good. Um, but it's from the work we've done in the battlefield, and it's also from my perspective as an HR director. And just before I go, the other thing that led me into this field was... There's only, in, in, the, in the FTSE 250 and the FTSE 100 in the UK, there's only been one black male group HR director in the FTSE 250, and there's only been one black male group HR director in the FTSE 100. And I've been both of them. And, 
And so what hit me was, why is there no other family, I say humbly, where the children in that family can look at a black father and not find another group HR director in this country? And so for me, it was about finding out what are the structures. I know, this, I know HR inside and out. What are the things that are challenging movement, not just here, in, but also in the U.S.? The first thing is vision. And some of this may be a penetrating glimpse at the obvious. Clients pay me for that at times. But, um, but vision. And so what the first place we start with when we work is where's the leadership on this? And what we have found, and, and we say this and people kind of look at us odd, but we said, you know, Every white man knows a white woman. And I'm like, no, no, okay, that's true. Um, but the, the point of that is, is that there's a comfort level and an ease with gender, and that women are part of the professional orbit of the C-suite, and they're part of the personal orbit of the C-suite. Black, Asian, ethnic minorities are rarely part of the professional orbit, and even less so part of the um, personal orbit. But the point is, is that the CEO he or she can envision in their lifetime a woman running their company. They're comfortable with it. It's part of what they can reach, what they can touch. There's a social accountability to that. They can envision a woman running their, country, their company. And so they put in the systems and, and backfill the systems to make that happen. What we have seen is that most CEOs can't envision a black person or a transgender person, or a disabled person running their organization. We know this because they can't even speak to the issue. And so if you start with a CEO who can't even envision that as part of the future of that organization, you already have a problem. And that is one of the problems that will challenge any behavioral intervention. The other one I want to go to, and this is going to be kind of sightseeing by airplane, so I recognize we're moving very quickly here. Um, but the issue of, and, and essentially you talk about authenticity and bringing yourself to work. Here's what we found in our qualitative view of, of the world about bringing yourself to work. We found two false positives that company rely on that they shouldn't. One is that we found with black and Asian ethnic minority staff, when you ask them to bring themselves to work on a scale of zero to 100, they score high. When you de-stack that and ask them how much of their heritage do they bring to work, they say none. So it's a very misleading. So, you know, do you bring your food to work? No, they're concerned about the way the food may smell. They don't want to talk about their food. They don't want to explain their food. They dress differently. They code switch. Um, they have different accents. And, and so we realize a lot of companies are feeling good because we have a high percentage of our, our underrepresented staff saying they bring themselves to work. No, you don't. They have discounted their heritage in that answer. The other thing we found is companies that have a high percentage of people say, you know, we bring 80, 90% of ourselves to work with black and Asian ethnic minority employees, is that when there's a high number it's also another false positive because it actually means they've disengaged. Because what they are saying is, we don't give a damn. I was going to say fuck, but I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> um, we don't give a damn. We're just going to be ourselves. We're just going to let it all hang out. We don't care what happens to us. We're bringing ourselves to work. Corn rolls and, and everything else you know, involved, and we won't get into the hair issue. Um, and so, again, the companies look at these numbers and say, all is well with our um, BAME population, but in fact, there's, there's two false positives. Let me trash two other things. One minute, that's going to be tough. Let me trash two other flavors of the day very quickly. Um, diverse recruitment panels. Every org Does anyone have diverse recruitment panels as their policy in the organization? Yeah, okay, well, that's a waste of time. So... <laughs> The reason is, is that women and black and Asian staff tend to be the most junior members in your hierarchy. You put them into a diverse recruitment path um, team. The CFO is sitting there saying, I want John as the head of treasury, and, and, and the female or the black or Asian member of the team who's more junior than the CFO says, no, Sally is the better. Who do you think is going to win? It doesn't work because most organizations have not looked at the power dynamic 
in the recruitment panels, and the black Asian or the um, female participant is always junior and will never have the decision-making power to impact that decision. So trash it or change it. Blind CVs, very interesting one, with one of our clients. What they hadn't taken account of, and I'm not a psychologist, is the behavioral impact. When the CEO says, I want more women, we're going to have 50-50% representation on the senior team. The recruiter looking at those CVs are positively discriminating for female candidates. They are bringing female candidates in disproportionate to their numbers because it's a corporate goal, it's a corporate priority. You blind the CV, and in this client, before the blind CVs, 50% of the female applicants got the job. Blind CVs, only one-third. You have three applicants, they're blind, your chances are one-third. They had not accounted for the behavior in that there was a positive discrimination taking place for female candidates. Blind CVs reduce their talent pool of female um, candidates. I'm being held up very quickly, so I will... Two things, one on, one on age, and then I think I'll go to the most fundamental one. The other, the other structural issue on age, which we don't talk about, which is really one of the big isms, is within the HR process, and any HR people here... All right, okay, and raise your hand if you love your nine box grids. Um, nine box grids, performance, potential, and executive teams spend hours deciding is it here or is it there. Well, guess what about those nine box grids when, um, grids when you pull back the curtain? No one over 45 is ever considered high potential. No one over 40 in every company. No one over 45 is considered high potential. It is based on an age-old concept. And, you know, there's a lot of work being done here in the UK by the um, Center of Aging Better. You have Linda Gratton's book, The 100-Year Life. That concept is that when you're over 45 or 50, by not being determined, deemed high potential, you lack leadership development, you lack opportunities, you lack expat assignments, you will be stripped. The last thing. The fundamental challenge we have in the diversity and inclusion field and where the behavioral interventions will fail is that they're based on an assumption. And the worst thing that has happened, as I realize in talking to clients, and in many clients you speak to them and they will say, things were better 10 or 15 years ago. We actually have more women. We actually have more black or Asian staff in senior positions. What's happened? I'll tell you what's happened, and we haven't done anything about it. In the 90s, when we went from the career for life, stripped that away, the biggest problem and challenge in the DNI field that you cannot deal with until we accept is the issue of self-managed careers. In the 90s, we went to the self-managed career concept on the assumption that we'll give everyone the keys, throw them in the middle of the jungle, and everyone will survive. And we didn't take into account that for the female or the black and Asian staff who hadn't been hunting and, and, and tracking, if you wish, in that jungle analogy, all their lives, and their fathers had been hunting and tracking and knew how to deal with that jungle and, and how to succeed and excel, we took away that talent management responsibility of the organization. And we assumed that everyone can manage in that new world by themselves. And guess what? They don't. And so what we're doing now is that we are just very discreetly backfilling that. So we're putting in sponsorship programs, mentorship programs, leadership programs, all sorts of programs that actually, if we move from a light touch talent management process to back to we take responsibilities and the organizations take responsibility for their talent, their talent development, leading them, tapping them on the shoulder, helping, nudging, you will find a big difference. But where things changed was when we went to this light touch, self-career management process. We have disadvantaged women and black and Asian and ethnic minority staff against their white counterparts because we assume everyone was starting from the same baseline. And until we address that, we will have challenges in all the other behavioral interventions.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So our final speaker now is Hannah Bird. Uh, Hannah is the principal, uh, principal advisor at the Behavioural Insights team, and she leads the Gender and Behavioural Insights programme with us at the Government Equalities Office. So she will be sharing some, some of our work and some exciting results. Thanks, Hannah. Thank you. Yes, it is my absolute pleasure to be the director of the Gender and Behavioural Insights Programme, this um, fantastic co collaboration with the Government Equalities Office. We set out to drive behaviour change for gender equality, and we also try to create new evidence in this space. As Hilary said at the top, we're building on a great foundation, so there is decades of work looking into this, trying to understand what works to improve gender equality. But there is more work to be done, and, um, and we certainly seek to uh, fill in some of the gaps that still exist in the evidence base. You can um, see some of that in uh, a publication that came out last year, and the refreshed version of which will be out very soon, um, called Actions for Employers, uh, to close the gender pay gap. And that's where you can find lots of the nuance um, of the evidence uh, put in very succinct and uh, friendly form for you of the um, kinds of interventions that Frank was talking about just there. Um, and that's really where we uh, lay out what we know so far about what works uh, to improve gender equality. The other great opportunity of this program is that we have some fantastic partnerships with lots of players across the UK labour force, labour market, um, including seven partnerships with employers. These employer partnerships give us an absolutely amazing access to some really, really rich data. They give us years of their personnel data where we can see how are women and men doing as they pass through into organisations and up the ladder. We get to see um, whether there are differences for women and men in starting salaries, in who gets recruited in the first place, in who gets promoted, what happens when you go part-time, uh, who makes it up into the higher levels of management, decision-making, and the C-suite. And we're finding some really fascinating things. It's a bit of a watch this space for the rest of this year, which is our final year of the program, where we will be able to uh, share these insights with you. But here I'm going to talk to you about one of the insights which stands out most of all to us. We find time and again when we look into the data of our employer partners that there is a huge penalty for staff who are working part-time, men and women, but predominantly women. And if I were to give you one nugget of information to take away where to look uh, to try and tackle gender equality, it would be in your organisations. Look at the outcomes and the experiences of your part-time staff. We're finding differences in the data that we have in terms of their starting salaries, their pay rises, their performance scores, and their opportunities to progress. And we think it's disproportionate to the effort they're putting in. So it may be reasonable to think that if you're working 20 hours a week, you might progress at half the rate of your uh, colleague who is working 40 hours a week. But what we're finding when we look at the data is that actually those staff who are in their contracts working 20 hours a week and often working 30, 35, 40 hours a week, they are not progressing at all at the same rates. The rates of that are negligible. We really think that we need to talk more about this if we're going to crack gender equality in the workplace. This is a graph um, that will be familiar to many of you. Um, it uh, shows the gender pay gap that grows after someone uh, has a baby. Um, what happens uh, yeah, in those 20 years after you have your first child? This is a, a very familiar trend um, in this country and around the world. What we see here is that the gender pay gap grows over 20 years. It doesn't immediately kick in as soon as someone has a child. And in fact, we, we see that women on average take uh, on average three years out of the labor market after they have a child. But, um, and then they're back in the labor force. So many of these uh, people are working over this 20 years, and yet the gender pay gap is growing. Why is that? 
this work was done by colleagues of ours at the Institute for Fiscal Studies, and they have done some really fascinating work to tease apart what the different drivers and behaviours might be that happen in that 20 years after someone has a child to really understand what is the behaviour that's driving this growth of the gap over uh, 20 years, making it pretty tricky for a woman to uh, get parity with a man over this time. And what they find is that if women and men worked part-time at the same rates, or if we rewarded our part-time workers at the same rate as our full-time workers, we would halve the gender pay gap. So it's absolutely huge to focus on part-time work arrangements and to encourage them to be something that not just mothers do, uh, but something that men do as well. Um, it seems to me that we are not going to stop caring for children, elderly people, uh, our disabled friends and relatives anytime soon. And if we are going to, and, and nor should we, <laughs> and if we are going to achieve gender equality, we really need to enable uh, men and women to juggle the work they do at work and the work they do out of work um, uh, at the, in the same ways. That's how we'll achieve equality. Or we'll take a big chunk out of it anyway. So there is work to be done to normalize part-time working. Um, and I'm really excited to be leading a program of work that is trying to tackle this in various ways. Um, we need to make part-time work easier to offer uh, from, by employers. We think there's something cognitively a little challenging for employers to get their heads around the idea that someone might not work uh, 35, 40 hours a week, every week, nine to five. Uh, we need to help employers to, uh, to be able to redesign their jobs and to advertise their jobs in a new way. We also need to make it easier for them to offer that and for uh, the people out there, this excellent talent pool, uh, to be able to find those jobs. We also need to make part-time work more attractive. It is understandable that lots of men and women do not want to work part-time because they see their part-time workers suddenly losing out on opportunities to progress, missing out on raises, and essentially stagnating their careers after they have a child. Um, so it needs to be fair, and it needs to be attractive to people. So what are we doing about this? And it's um, my pleasure uh, to talk about some really fresh findings that we have on the program from some research we've been doing in the real world to try and encourage employers to offer more flexible work. This is where I get to spend a little more time talking about those results you will have heard from David Halpern in the opening session of this conference um, where, where we uh, announce some of these. So the issue here is that we know lots of people want flexibility. They want it so they can care for their families, but also th so they can care for themselves, their own well-being, um, and, and um, have balance in their lives. And yet there's a mismatch, because when we scrape the data from um, websites, and this is uh, work by colleagues of ours at TimeWise, um, they found that around 10% of jobs are offered with explicit flexible working options, and we need to close that gap. So this is what we did. This is working with a job site. Um, and we inserted a new uh, page into the process that employers use to post jobs. Um, this is what they started to see. It was an opportunity to list the um, that they offered in their jobs and made it very easy for an employer to click when they offered uh, these options. This is then what the um, job seeker would see when they were looking at jobs. You can see at the bottom here, very salient, very simple to see that there are flexible working options uh, offered by the Pizza Palace in this case. So what happened? Well, we looked to see whether, uh, whether this new slide had any impact in terms of um, employers offering more jobs, and we found that it did. It had a really big impact. Um, we were bowled over when we saw these results. So we think that uh, we increased the rates of employers offering flexible working options by 20%. And if that stays in place for a year, we would find 174,000 more flexible jobs uh, made available in the, um, in the economy. Um, that's tens of thousands more conversations that people can have on their way into a new job where they can uh, be negotiating for ways to juggle their work and their um, life outside of work. There's a real beauty in this, in that these, um, this change in the template also gives job seekers a chance to change their behavior. Um, and we looked to see whether adverts that offered more flexible working options attracted more people, and we found that it did. 
So those adverts that offered flexible working options on average were attracting around seven more applications. This is a real, um, really important piece of empirical evidence now that whenever you say um, diversity and inclusion is good for your uh, organization, it will increase your talent pool. Here's some really hard numbers that you can use to back that up. So we're finding that this is effective. Um, and the next question is, how can we move beyond this? How can we really make flexible working the default? Um, this is a, a kind of highlight for the kinds of results you'll see coming out of the program in the coming year. Uh, this is some work we've been doing with Zurich Insurance, who've been really radical in working with us. Um, and they have decided to flip the default of the way they advertise all their new roles, unless there's a strong business case not to. All new roles will now be advertised as open to part-time, job share, um, or less than full-time uh, arrangements, or full-time if you must. And we're looking to see what this does to the rates of women moving up an organization um, and of men and women working part-time and all those other um, factors that we're interested in. We really need to see part-time working normalized so that we can reward those important parts of our workforce equally um, and also balance work and care. I'll leave you with a final slide which just uh, flashes up some of the questions that we are asking as we uh, carry on with these fantastic collaborations throughout the program. I'm excited to bring you these um, real-world findings over the ne next year, and I would say watch the space for those. Thank you. Right, so lots and lots of uh, rich material there for discussion. And if one of our objectives as the Government Equalities Office is to try and understand better the data that's out there and draw it in, debate it, and try and use it to inform our practice, it's brilliant to have all of the things that you have brought to that to inform this debate. So thank you so much. So we've had some really interesting questions coming through Slido, so thank you to those of you who have contributed. I will try and sort of pull out some of the key themes that have come through those discussions as we go. But I might start with an introductory question, which is a lot of the work we have, uh, you have talked about and we've, we've been discussing here um, does turn a bit on this question of bias. Are people consciously biased? Are they unconsciously biased? Uh, do you think there is a role for trying either explicitly or implicitly to address bias in work to improve diversity and inclusion? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this could be a very I, short <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I If I understand you correctly, I think you're, you're asking whether... Um, like whether the conversation should be about implicit bias, explicit bias, both, neither. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess from my perspective, I would say there is no conversation to be had that does not overtly and very upfrontly highlight the reality of overt bias. Mm -hmm. um, I think you know organizations do have to start being more brave and acknowledging why they look how they look. Mm -hmm. They look how they look, not necessarily because of decades of overt bias, in themselves, but they do look how they look in part because of overt bias in the broader social systems that are out there. We know that to have been true. You know, 50 years ago, the people who were allowed into schools, who had opportunities, were not the same people in the same distribution as they are now. And some of those dynamics are ongoing. Um, so I guess I, one of the mistakes I see happening out there is that a lot of companies are very ready to talk about implicit bias. What that means is that they ignore the role of explicit or overt bias, and that is alienating to women and minorities mm -hmm. uh, because they know it's happening. They see it in front of them. It limits the conversations that they can have, and it creates this sense that um, the, it, it's in the system and it's everywhere, so maybe it's not my job to fix mm -hmm. it, rather than the sense that everyone, no matter what your role is, should be working to figure out how to reduce the bias in whatever you do. Yeah, thank you. What I would yeah. add to that is that it's absolutely vital that we keep talking about sexism, racism, ageism. That's key. But we also need to be talking um, in ways that enable um, 
those busy professionals who have been banging their heads against the wall, the, the wall on these questions for years and are finding that unconscious bias training isn't working for them, there are still these issues in their organization, uh, we need to start talking about the concrete ways that they can be changing their processes in order to design this bias out. And sometimes it can lead to a less toxic conversation when you're giving uh, those busy HR professionals new solutions, for example, where we're saying, focus on the opportunities for your part-time employees. That's sometimes an easier conversation for some of those colleagues who are switched off by a conversation about implicit bias, um, because it gives uh, new positive ways for us to go forwards and, and make some concrete changes that could then have the same impacts and outcomes that we all want to see. Mm. Thank you. Frank, Elizabeth? Well, I think, you know, because I... I think we let people off the hook too easy mm -hmm. when we talk about this unconscious bias. Because yeah. again, I, you know, when, when I'm dealing in, in companies, very little of it is unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. the, the, the manager knows when he's chosen Josh over Mohammed. Mm -hmm. It's not unconscious. Mm -hmm. He knows exactly what he or she is doing. Um, what I have found that it, it, it is probably more of a factor of lack of self-awareness and if you wish, ignorance mm -hmm. um, in terms of the surroundings and, and, and the impact people, their actions have on people. And it could be minor things. I mean, when we speak to people, you know, when you talk about inclusion, exclusion, the in out groups, you know, if the manager starts off his or her meeting talking about the ski trip in their house in Maribel, <laughs> you know, um, or cheese, which has come up quite a bit. People said <laughs> the managers talk about cheese in their meetings. <laughs> True stories. Um, <laughs> It, it, it's not, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a bias. It's just the bubble they live in, the world they live in, the people like them that they're used to, and it's just the lack of self-awareness and, and like I say, in, in a lot of cases, it, ignorance about things. And so I know there are psychological terms, and it's, it's, it makes it a little easier and convenient, but in reality, it, it, lack of self-awareness would probably knock down a lot of this, or, yeah. or self-awareness will knock down a lot of this. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I do think that, especially when the term is um, misused, when we say unconscious bias um, or implicit bias, I think um, there's a group of people that interpret that as it's not my fault bias. Yeah. Um, and I think these points are really, you know, really accurate that there's actually just a lot of explicit bias. It doesn't help that we try to solve a lot of problems with training. And in this case, we don't have any evidence that implicit bias training works. Um, but we are generating evidence about the conditions under which bias affects people and affects decision making. And we do have evidence that under certain conditions that bias can have more or less detrimental effects. Um, and so being honest with ourselves and with our managers about how ingrained that racism and sexism and bias is, is actually a really important part of uh, making the commitment to, to change the, the structures under which that affects people. Yeah. If, if I can just throw on, the, the other issue is, is structural bias. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in, in, in one client, um, they have an internal job posting system, and the manager is allowed to tick if there's a preferred candidate for the job. What we found in that company is that two thirds of black and Asian ethnic minority employees were not likely to apply for the job if it had a preferred candidate, mm -hmm. and one third of the women were not likely to apply for the job if it had a preferred candidate. So right there, you know, take away the preferred candidate part of the structure mm -hmm. and you've opened up the talent pool or at least the sense of a greater accessibility of the talent pool. So some of it is just, again, it's structural. There, there's just little nuanced structural things mm -hmm. that happen every day that just you know, um, layers onto this. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, really interesting. Thank you. I, I don't think I was expecting the answer that no, we shouldn't uh, focus on this at all. But really interesting to unpack that. And I think it's even as you're discussing whether um, bias is implicit or explicit, explicit or discussed or verbalized or you're, you're aware of your own bias. I think all of those issues sort of point to the complexity of it, don't they? And then furthermore, what your solution is for trying to tackle it. So trying to do as much as we can around the structures, the systems, the processes that acknowledges that bias exists and trying to remove it as far as possible does feel like it's a sort of fertile area to explore. So quite a lot of the questions that have come through on Slido have been about 
other types of uh, diversity and inclusion. So we've, um, we've talked about gender quite a lot. We've talked a bit about race. We've touched on um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. Um, so we've had some questions about what about class? What about attractiveness, accent, age, um, uh, people's stage of life, so questions about when you're a carer. I'm just interested if we could sort of stick to some of those other characteristics um, that we don't so often talk about. Are you aware of work in that sphere? Does, has any of your work explicitly touched on some of those other, other characteristics? I think, uh, I'll just start, I think a lot of times um, the more nuanced or kind of more cutting edge research in this space is really thinking about the intersectionality there. Yeah. So when we talk about in the US context, for example, uh, race and stereotypes about race, oftentimes that's very interlinked with stereotypes about socioeconomic class or neighborhood or names. Um, and so um, it's really important to think about how those things fit together. Um, in some of my research, you know, we talk about identity threat with some of these kind of classic categories. I'm starting to think a little bit more about kind of role identity threat, which has more to do with your social status in the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean to be um, the least well-paid person or the person who didn't have a fancy Ivy League degree in a hospital? Mm -hmm. If that's really correlated with what does it mean to be like the nurse's assistant in a hierarchy in a hospital or what does it mean to be the administrative assistant in the academy or in my case, the 911 dispatcher compared to a police officer, all these things kind of... Um, interact mm -hmm. uh, in ways that are meaningful. But I do think, and this is a criticism I think of, of uh, the field, um, that we do each of those subcategories a little bit of a disservice by grouping everyone together and thinking that like being black is the same as being a female, which is the same as being um, older than the population. And, and we really do need to target each of these um, types of different stereotypes separately as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, in my research and in my broader perspective in studying sense of belonging, I would say any of these characteristics can be a source of uh, kind of uncertain or fragile belonging in an organizational context, but it really depends on who you are in the context, mm -hmm. how much that identity comes to be salient for you, and also how other people view that identity. Not, not even yourself, just that identity in general. Mm -hmm. So if you belong to a workplace where um, people come from really diverse social class backgrounds, mm -hmm. where uh, the, maybe the organization is even known for um, you know, moving people upward in, in the trajectory from the shop floor into management, and there's a lot of mobility there, you might come from an underrepresented social class background but not have any concerns about belonging in the context. Mm. Um, this is part of why I think it's so important for organizations to actually start thinking about belonging mm. and not kind of hold that we can work on inclusion, but we're not going to think as much about what's, what people's experiences are. I actually think they need to take a more experience-driven approach to understand where the biggest problems are. Um, I was recently doing research in collaboration with a company that's a, um, it's a, it's a grouping of sub-companies that work in the marketing and media space. And in this organization, they would have sworn up and down to me that their LGBTQ plus population is super happy, feels totally like they belong. And yet when we actually assessed it from the perspectives of these employees, that was the group that the research and the data tells us are experiencing the most sense of threat and the least sense of opportunity for advancement. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, you know, definitely everything you said, plus pairing it with the fact that you can collect this data and you can look at the data um, through the lens of different identity sets to help you gain insight into what people are actually experiencing. Yeah, interesting. And um, on LGBT, that reflects some of the findings we've had through work at the Government Equalities Office. We did a survey a couple of years ago, which, as it turns out, was the biggest uh, survey of LGBT people in the world. So we had 108,000 responses. And one of the findings there was that despite sort of legislative progress, um, two-thirds of uh, same-sex couples didn't feel comfortable holding the hand of their same-sex partner walking down the street. And so... 
it, that sort of interplay between your legal rights and legal advancement and your sense of being able to be yourself fully belong and be, inclusive, uh, be included. So, Frank, you touched on code switching. I'm, um, this, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this as a term. There's been quite a lot of debate, hasn't there, um, about uh, in the US, certainly in terms of kind of uh, congresswomen being able to sort of swap uh, between different sort of uh, ways of discussing what they're doing. So it'd be helpful just to unpack that a bit. But I was also interested in this question about like the cognitive load. So if you don't, if you are in an organisation where you don't feel you belong or you're not totally sure that your behaviour fits what is expected you're sort of your brain is working twice as hard isn't it to either respond to the identity threat to recalibrate your behavior and then actually do the job or the work that you're trying to do so it'd be really helpful just to get you know maybe unpack this notion of sort of code switching a bit and then um it sort of plays in some of the wider issues Okay. <laughs> um, well, I mean, it, it started out in the 70s more about people who, 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 who had a second language. Mm -hmm. So let's say you, you, you're French born and raised and you go home and you speak French and you come to the workplace and you speak English. You know, that, that was the genesis of it in, in terms of moving between languages. And what has happened over the years and, and, and the last um, 10, 15 years is that it's been applied to the issue of, of ethnic minorities in the workplace versus their, their heritage culture. Um, and so, you know, one, one of, one, it, it's, it's not always about behavior. It's, always, it's, it's about look. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, we, we, we had um, one client where one of the senior black women in, in, in the office um, had been wearing her hair um, straight, for, um, I'm sorry, natural, for about nine years, and she decided that, you know, she wanted to play with it, and she was going to wear it natural, mm -hmm. and she came into the office that Monday, and her manager said to her, that's the most professional I've seen you looking, mm -hmm. you know, since you've been here. Um, now, you know, she decided not to, you know, code switch and, 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 and look the part, but the, 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 the key part of it from the employee point of view, from the lived experience point of view, is that every organization has an archetype of a leader, um, written or unwritten. Every organization has an archetype. And if you line up the top 50 in a global organization, you will find a host of attributes yeah. that are very similar to them, and it's very known to the employees. And, and so the challenge for, for the employee is that if they're not part of that dominant culture, yeah. how much do they want to play to be part of it? Um, so I, I, I worked, worked for a, 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 a Dutch company, and, and probably because it was Dutch, but all the senior leaders were 6'2", six, 6'3", six, or taller, <laughs> and all the women were at least 5'9", or 5'10". Or, 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 or now, no one said you had to be tall to get ahead, but there's an archetype. Yeah. Um, and even let's take on the gender issue. We, we, when we... When we spoke to women, we speak to women sometimes, there's an archetype of a senior woman. And then as one person said it, the senior women in this organization wear heels and the junior women wear flats. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And so, you know, even at, you know, in, 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 in that... <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm actually. I mean, how tall is everyone? Is everyone feeling a bit paranoid now? Um, <laughs> Either but, paranoid or like you've aced it and you yeah, should go but, to the But there's, there's, all yeah. sub, there's all sorts of subliminal signs of what you should do to fit in. Yeah. And, and, and the code switching, and, and, and for me, the, 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 the goal of every organization is to reduce the amount of code switching that any given employee needs yeah. to succeed in that organization. Yeah, interesting, interesting. And I, I, there's clearly lots of uh, read across in terms of um, the work around inclusion and belonging, isn't yeah. there, into that. Um, so we've had quite a few questions come through Slido about uh, some of the work that Hannah was talking about in terms of gender pay and sort of motherhood and the motherhood penalty and part-time penalties. Because we are um, about a minute away from being due to finish this session, what I'm going to suggest... Sorry, Hannah, probably should have checked this. Is um, there's quite a lot of us here from the Government Equalities Office who'd be really happy to kind of unpack some of these questions on gender in a little bit more detail if you are keen to. Um, so I might kind of suggest, Hannah, if you sort of loiter there and other, <laughs> other members of the team um, and others who want to carry on that conversation do that. But this question, uh, one of the questions a lot of people have asked is actually from the work that you have done. Um, 
where you have looked at very senior leaders. So either questions about burnout, senior mm-hmm. leaders, sense of sort of belonging and uh, identity. And it would just be interesting to get your reflections on where you think uh, the work is on that, whether there might be more work we could look at. Mm-hmm. Uh, go ahead. Well, sure. <laughs> so, um, so for those of us who do kind of quantitative empirical work, there's a challenge with studying leaders mm-hmm. with the same level of rigor just because there's fewer of them. Yeah. Um, and what that means is that um, a lot of the research and evidence base that we have about leadership um, doesn't have the same methodological flavor. Mm-hmm. Um, what, we, what we do know from, from research on, on leadership uh, is how important it is, how important exposure to leaders that look different is. Um, we know uh, that when leaders... Uh, role model good behavior when it comes to part-time work or leaving the office on time or protecting their own time in terms of burnout. Um, that does seem to have cascading effects. Um, I have pushed against uh, focusing on burnout of leaders just because even though there's a lot of talk about burnout at the leadership level or at the senior level, there was also a lot of talk over the past decade about stress um, and some interesting kind of survey results that said that, oh, actually, like as you move up in a company, um, people report higher stress. Well, it turns out that that's not, in fact, true. Mm-hmm. So uh, leaders at the top might have the language to talk about burnout and stress differently, but the people who are actually experiencing burnout uh, and stress at higher levels um, are, are not the ones that are at the top of the uh, economic or company ladder. And so... While I think it's really important that people study uh, leaders, um, I just don't want us to focus on the loudest voices uh, Mm -hmm. when we talk about things like stress um, and and burnout. Uh, And and that means uh, not necessarily just focusing on the people who are comfortable using the words, like, I am so stressed. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, that's all I have to say there. Very busy. (laughs) Yeah, no, quite. Really interesting. Thank you. And I will will draw us to a closer. This is... It's a really rich discussion, isn't it? And I I sort of, as I said at the beginning, I think the key for us is trying to build build our understanding to try and work out what's driving different behaviour, what can we do to tackle it, and what can we really do to sort of unleash the talent, potential, and capability of, of everyone so that when people come to work, when they're operating in their social environments, their family environments, they are able to be their fullest and best selves. And I think the, the research that you were all doing, the work that you've talked about, is a massive contribution to that debate. Thank you. There is more to do, and as, as others have said, we'd be keen to work with as many of you as possible who are interested in taking this forward. Um, but for now, thank you so much thank to you. our panel members. Thank you. Thank you.